All right, I think we have enough to get started. And we're excited to get started talking about this topic. So we won't make you wait any longer. First, I wanna say welcome to everyone on the phone. Thank you for joining our webinar today where we answer the question, are you creating brand champions? Uh, this will be a time for us to discuss how to measure brand conversion in experiential marketing. And other than just myself and my co-host Tasha, we'll also be inviting a couple brand leaders who have experience with creating and measuring brand champions a little later on in our session. Uh, before we get to that, I'd like to have my co-host Tasha introduce herself. Thanks, Lauren. Hi, everybody. My name is Tasha, and I am an account manager here at AnyRoad. I work with some of our clients, such as Michael's and Diageo, and I'm really excited to speak to you today about brand conversion. Thanks for co-hosting with me, Tasha. It's been a pleasure putting this together with you. Uh, my name is Lauren. I am the VP of Customer Success here at AnyRoad. And uh, before we dive into our topic, just wanna cover a couple of housekeeping items for today. The first is Q&A. Uh, we are going to ask you to be as interactive as possible throughout this webinar. So please do feel free to ask questions. Uh, our colleague, Jesse, is also on the line who will be helping us moderate. Um, so if we don't get to your question, we will definitely follow up with you afterwards and we'll answer a couple questions at the end as well. Uh, if you haven't used a webinar on Zoom before, you can also configure your audio on the bottom left of your screen. You can tweet at us at any road with a hashtag experiential. Uh, this is really what we're all about is the experience. So we'd love to hear your feedback. And we're also gonna be recording today's webinar and we'll share this after today's session. For those of you who aren't so familiar, also I want to cover off a couple notes about who we are and why we exist. So what is AnyRoad? Uh, we are an all-in-one platform for brands who host experiences. Uh, we provide actionable data to brands who are on the forefront of the experience economy about what's working and what's not about their experiences. Uh, for the purpose of today's session, I'm going to probably use the word experience far too much, um, but for all intents and purposes, this could be a class, this could be a training, it could be a tour, an activation, really the sky is the limit. And we're talking about experiences that happen both online and in person. Any road can be used for all different types of experiences to help brands understand what's working and what's not. So some of the leading brands, like I mentioned, are working with us to measure the effectiveness of their experiences. And this includes things like measuring how many brand champions they are converting from people attending their classes, people attending their tours. And so I think one thing that unites these, all these brands and the folks who we work with is they face this universal hurdle, which is really able to measure and quantify whether or not their experiences are effective. Uh, brands invest so much time and money and energy and heart. And this is why we love working with all of you on the, on the phone who are at these brand homes, because you invest so much energy and investment into creating these wonderful experiences for your guests. And I think anecdotally, Tasha would agree that the folks who we work with know that people leave the experiences happier than when they came in. Um, but it's been practically impossible for them to quantify and measure if this is working and, and how to really put a number on how well they're doing at converting these people into brand champions. Uh, and I know Tasha has a personal example of how she became a brand champion and how um, she was converted because of an experience. Thanks, Lauren. So as mentioned, I do have a personal experience that I recently had that really highlighted an example of where brand conversion could have been used which was an unfortunately not so recent trip to Domain Chandon Winery in Sonoma. Uh, to be totally honest, before this visit, I never really took much notice at the labels on the bottles of wine I was buying. Whatever was an offer or closest to me on the shelf would suffice at the time. Uh, then my friends and I took an amazing trip to Sonoma and did a wine tasting at Domain Chandon. And from the moment I walked through the beautiful entrance way, which you can see in this picture. I just loved every single moment of my experience. The surroundings were beautiful. The staff were so passionate and friendly. Um, we were able to sit in the gardens and try a few of the wines that they have there, specifically the sparkling one. And the experience really resonated with me so much that since then, anytime I'm going to a housewarming or even just looking for a nice bottle of wine for a Friday night, I'll look for the Domaine Chandon brand, whereas before I would never have done so. 
So I think what this really shows is that this one experience turned me from someone who had a neutral opinion of the brand into a champion and someone who, you know, was going out there telling my friends to buy Chandon and somebody that was also going back to the same location to, to have the same experience again. Speaking to that, Domain Chandon are not the only brand to invest in experiences though. In fact, the top 350 US consumer brands spent $65 billion on experiences to engage 80 million customers in 2018. Now, despite this large injection of funds towards experiences, many brands are still asking, did it work? Was the money spent successful in increasing the revenue or the number of consumers that were using their brands? Now, what if there was a way <laughs> a way to quantify exactly how many fans brands gain or lose because of the experiences they host. Beyond simple anecdotes, brands can measure the impact and report on returns using a single core metric. And that metric is, of course, brand conversion. So what this measurement looks at specifically is the percentage of guests whose perception of your brand significantly improves and the percentage of guests whose perception of your brand significantly falls. And then by combining, <clears throat> excuse me, by combining this metric with consumer experience and operational data, brands can answer questions such as who were attending these experiences, how successful were they, and why did they have the impact they did on guests? Thanks, Tasha. I think that that pretty, pretty much sums up the metric in, at a very high level of brand conversion. But I'm curious uh, of our audience, how many of you out there have heard of brand conversion? So I'm going to be launching this question as a poll. So please give us some feedback here. Let us know. Have you heard of brand conversion? Yes or no? Um, and we can, we can try and tailor the rest of our talk based on your answer here. Great. We have a few respondents. Wait for a few more. Looks like we got a lot of folks out there who have at least heard of brand conversion. Maybe they haven't started using it yet, but that's what we're here to talk about today. Great, thanks everyone for voting. I will share the results here. So you can actually see that there are several folks in the audience who have heard of brand conversion, but there is a minority out there who hasn't yet heard of brand conversion. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about what it is, uh, why it exists, and how to calculate it so that before we dive into uh, some applications of brand conversion, we can all be on the same page with, with our knowledge about brand conversion itself. So first of all, what is brand conversion? Simply, it's a metric that measures what percent of guests had a significant increase in their perception. This would be the positive brand conversion number and the number that brands want to see as high or as close to 100% as possible. Uh, on the flip side of that, you also have negative brand conversion, which measures the percent of guests whose perception decreases significantly because of the experience. Um, there are some times when you start out as a fan, you go through the experience, maybe something goes a little bit wrong or a little bit off, and that would result in a negative brand conversion. So of course, you want this number to be as low or as close to 0% as possible. And why do we measure brand conversion? Simply, it's that ability to measure the impact of an experience on your guests. Uh, I think that this is something that all brand homes, all brand leaders crave, is the ability to really see the results of all of their investment in their experiences and to really make sure that they're connecting with guests. Brand conversion does determine the positive and negative impact from an experience. And most of all, it empowers brands to make changes and innovate based on this number to increase their positive impact and reduce the negative impact. Uh, you probably think this is a great metric, but how do I get started? Uh, and we are going to be focusing on some practical applications here. So uh, the first way to get started is to ask a simple question before the experience, ask the same question after the experience, and then measure the difference in the results. So Tasha's going to walk through what that question is, how to harness its power, and some examples of it in action. Thanks, Lauren. So before we get into the nitty gritty of the math that's used to calculate brand conversion, we need to take a closer look at another metric that's used, and this is called the Net Promoter Score, or NPS. 
So the way the NPS works is that guests are asked, how likely are you to recommend insert brand name to a friend or colleague? Guests can then give a response on a scale from zero to 10. Anyone who gives a score from zero to six is marked as a detractor or someone who would actively spread negative feedback on a brand. Anybody who gives seven or eight as a score is called a passive and are seen as someone that is neutral. And finally, anyone who gives nine or 10 are seen as a promoter and are people who will actively champion a brand and do things such as refer friends and spread positive reviews. Now that we've had a quick overview of NPS, I'm curious to know if any of you are currently measuring NPS. So we're gonna do another quick poll here. If you guys can let us know, are you measuring NPS? Maybe you don't know if you're measuring it. We'd love to hear from you. How are we looking, Lauren? Are we getting some responses getting some great in? responses in. Eight. Seems like while folks had heard of brand conversion, there are not necessarily as many folks who are measuring that promoter score. So I'm gonna wait for a few more people to vote, just to make sure we're not skewing our results here. <laughs> Highly scientific poll on the Zoom webinars. <laughs> cool, thanks everyone for voting. I'm gonna ask for one more call for responses. Great. So here are the results. Tasha, what do you think? Wow, that's actually a lot more split than I thought it would be. Me I too, me too. I thought there'd be a couple more people that were already measuring NPS. So it's interesting to see that, that there are quite a few folks who either aren't doing it or they're not sure if they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Great. Tasha can tell you a little bit more about NPS and how it connects with brand conversion. Perfect. So thanks everybody for your feedback on that poll. And now that we've explain the different buckets of responders we can have. I want to outline to you the two types of brand conversion change experiences that can happen. So here we have an example from California Kitchen, which is a hypothetical cooking store that also hosts experiences. Uh, the first conversion we're going to talk about is positive brand conversion change. So an example of this is someone who originally would have given a score of four when asked how likely they were to recommend California Kitchens to a friend or colleague. This may be down to potentially hearing negative reviews from friends about this location before, maybe having a negative experience here previously, or potentially someone who maybe doesn't have a defined view of the brand. They maybe haven't even heard of it before, so they simply gave a low score. They then attend a new experience here, maybe a cooking class where they loved the fresh, fresh produce, they made a delicious meal, and had friendly staff helping them with the task. So this positive experience then impacted their view of the brand and they increased their likelihood to recommend California Kitchen from a four to a nine. Therefore, they turned from a detractor into a promoter, making this a positive, positive brand conversion. So then the reverse to this is a negative brand conversion. An example of this would be someone who was previously a champion of California Kitchen rating it a nine. However, again, after attending a cooking class here and having a negative experience drop down to a detractor rating it a five. Now this may have been due to a poor instructor, maybe the facilities were dirty or unclean, but this one experience has now affected their view of this brand, resulting in a negative brand conversion. Great, thanks Tasha for walking us through those. I think now, Having looked at some of the individual scores and how individual people may be impacted or may convert based on an experience, we wanted to walk through a real life example of how a CPG brand has used brand conversion to measure the effectiveness of their experiences. So for this case, we worked with a CPG brand who wanted to offer guests a really innovative experience. They wanted to experiment with both in-person or in-store experiences, as well as online experiences. Uh, their goal was to really hone in on new audiences or people unfamiliar with their brand to convert them and build brand loyalty. Uh, I think that this is a goal for many of the brands who we work with is to really build up that brand loyalty and brand affinity uh, with their guests. And the way that this CPG brand was going to measure the effectiveness and see if they hit their goal was to meet or exceed an 80% brand conversion. So 
we looked at we're going to look at how to calculate the brand conversion in case you do want to take a stab at this or you love the numbers and want to dive into the methodology. Uh, we're also going to talk about the, how how the CPG brand came out. Did they hit their goal or not? And why guests either converted or didn't? And then what multidimensional data this brand used to improve their brand conversion long term? So first, for the folks out there who love numbers like I do, uh, here's a little sneak peek into the methodology. Uh, for those who are not as keen on the math, don't worry about this because any row takes care of all the calculations for you. So you really don't have to stress over the numbers. Uh, this is just a, an example to illustrate how you would calculate positive brand conversion for those who are curious about the math. So you can see here that this CPG brand asked the how likely are you to recommend question before the visit. And what turned up was they had 52 detractors. These are the little red dots and 33 passive guests who came to the experience before they visited. This was their perception. After the experience, what happened was they found that there was a set of these detractors who converted into promoters and a set who created um, into passive. So they actually had 24 of those 52 detractors who converted into these green circles who are the promoters and another 19 who became passives. They also found that of their pre-visit passive visitors, they had several who actually exited the experience as promoters. So they were really happy to see that there were impacts from the experience that were felt by the guests and measured by this score. Then to uh, create the calculation, we basically added these two different pools, the pre-visit pool of detractors and passives together, and the post-visit pool of those who converted together. So we were able to see that pre-visit, there were 85 people who were in the detractor or passive category. And afterwards, of those 85 folks, they had 57 people who converted into promoters or passive. If you do a little quick division here, you can actually see that 57 over 85 resulted in a 67% positive brand conversion. Uh, Another way to look at this is to think about it a little bit more simply to see that two and three guests whose perception significantly improved because of their online experience resulted in this 67% positive brand conversion for this CPG brand. So now that we've seen the math, thanks to Lauren of how to calculate brand conversion, maybe asking how and why do we use this information? So before we look at brand conversion specifically related to the CPG partner, I want to highlight how important it is not to look at brand conversion in isolation. You need to dig deeper and use other data points to get the full picture and really understand why guests have given the score that they have and then how to improve this where needed. So there are different types of data that can be used to slice and dice brand conversion and understand why they're converting and why they're not. The first is consumer information, looking at things such as demographics, geography, and segmentation. Perhaps your experience is having a negative impact specifically on females in their 20s from a specific country. You can then dig deeper into this and determine how to change their perception now that you understand your target audience a little bit better. Secondly, it's important to look close at the experience itself. Is the content of the experience lining up with what guests want and are expecting? Is the quality of the content up to scratch? and is what is being shared relevant to guests. Finally, it's also important to review the actual operations of the experience. Do the logistics of how guests are arriving, leaving, and then what they're actually doing during their time on site, fostering a positive experience for them. Maybe is the capacity of the class not optimal? Do you need to increase or decrease this in order to make it a more impactful experience? And finally, are there certain times or dates that are preferable for guests? A real life example of this can be seen in the next few slides relating to the math that Lauren showed previously for the CPG partner. So with these two online experiences, we wanted to start by looking at the positive brand conversion for the CPG partner. So as you can see, experience A was 19% more effective at creating fat brand fans than experience B. We then looked at various experiential dimensions here, including feedback and demographics to understand the drastic difference in the conversion between these two experiences. 
We then looked at negative brand conversion to see if these statistics were consistent with the positive brand conversion, and they were. Experience B had a 3% higher negative brand conversion than experience A, meaning that it resulted in more lost funds. So after this, it was clear that experience B needed to be reviewed in detail to better understand this difference. Our CPG partner wanted to understand why there was a 19% difference between the two experiences and then determine how to improve their average conversion, which was 67%, and hit the industry average of 83%. So how are they going to do this? We needed to review the qualitative data, which Lauren is going to take you through now. Thanks, Tasha. Yeah, I think qualitative data is a really nice complement to brand conversion and helps brands understand get the score that they do and how to improve or change their experience based on their guest feedback. So when we dug into the feedback, we found two common themes. Uh, we use a little bit of art, a little bit of science, and a lot of uh, data technology to find these themes. And so we, we uncovered that there were two big categories. Uh, the first was a guest's knowledge of the brand was insufficient, and that was causing them a little bit of a sour taste in their mouth after they left the experience. The second was around logistics. I think this specifically applied to online experiences, but logistics can also be a challenge for in-person experiences where guests may have a, a hard time getting to the meeting point or navigating the experience itself. Uh, for this example specifically, though, it was around um, the use of Zoom, it being difficult to sign in, and I'm sure we're all very too familiar probably with these challenges of logistics, which our guests were feeling as well. So on the first topic of, of consumer knowledge, consumers really had a different baseline knowledge of the brand, which was causing this difference in brand conversion. Uh, the first experience, Experience A, had a much more knowledgeable set of guests who were actually repeat and they were familiar with the experience where two and three guests knew enough about the brand coming in. So they were able to convert at a much higher rate. On experience B, that was very much contrasted where fewer than one in 10 guests were repeat for experience B. So there was a lot more product education, a lot more brand education that needed to happen as part of this experience to make sure that guests were really well versed and familiar with the brand upon their departure. Uh, we're not going to get too much into these other multidimensional data pieces today, but wanted to give a little snapshot into how the CPG brand continued to unpack and work with their consultant and account manager here at Any Road to understand how to make an impact on their brand conversion. Uh, we did some CPG industry benchmarking, looked at other CPG leaders, the industry average, um, and some other close competitors to see where the CPG brand's brand conversion fell within the spectrum of their industry. So looked at some key brand conversion uh, keywords or drivers. Again, using things like natural language processing to pull out key themes and compare and contrast what was happening with in-person experiences compared to what was happening with online experiences and how much elements like the host and the elements of safety and interactivity were really playing to a guest experience. So metrics like these, things around the guest experience, their demographics, like their age group or their location, their geographics, can really help brands understand their brand conversion and leverage this metric across several different experience types or several different experiences within their organization. Um, it allows brands to do benchmarking within their own company, within their own infrastructure, to see how things are performing, how to build lookalike audiences that will perform optimally when they actually start playing these experiences. So brand conversion can be really powerful and teach brands a lot about what's working and what's not in their experiences. And finally, we want to just wrap up with four tactics that we used with the CPG brand to uh, improve their brand conversion and reach their goal of 80%. Uh, the first one is around data capture. So making sure that we're collecting first party guest data to be able to do this segmentation after the experience. So any road allows all brands to do first party data capture at registration and after the experience to maximize the analytical potential that we have for understanding the impact of experiences. 
the second tactic that we recommended was around the content. A lot of brands struggle with this and it takes some experimentation, but once you really hone in on what content is gonna be most relevant to your audience, that's really where you start to see brand conversion uh, growing. Uh, and so this for the CPG brand included a lot more brand education for newcomers who weren't as, as experienced with uh, the content and the brand. The third is around access. So making sure that for online experiences, it's easy for people to log in, that they have access to the video platform that you're using. And with in-person, that can mean a whole host of different challenges. So things like parking uh, in times of COVID, like today, making sure that check-in is easy, safe, and contactless, as well as it being streamlined with your brand and of the same quality that you would expect of the experience throughout. And finally, making sure that you're defining the audience really clearly. So if there's a specific audience that you're trying to reach, make sure that your marketing and experiences are catered to them and clearly defined around really you know, what they're looking for and what they're hoping to expect. Great, so next up, I am very excited to introduce Amy Evling, who is a tour supervisor at the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Amy, are you on the line? I think you just need to unmute yourself. Let me see if I can help with that. Story of my life. <laughs> no, what is Zoom call called? We didn't have some trouble with muting, so don't worry about I'm it. I'm so good at screwing this up. It's amazing. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'm just going to kick off here by asking you to tell the audience a little bit about Sierra Nevada and the experiences that you offer at your two locations, Chico and Mills River. Yeah, absolutely. We um, actually focus a lot on the, um, uh, you know, proactive guest experiences. Um, you know, it's kind of pre-COVID, post-COVID uh, right now. So pre-COVID, we were... Um, any on-site experience that you could um, you could imagine was really our our expertise. So if you wanted um, the basic brewery um, brewery tour from all the way from a forty-five minute basic brewery tour all the way up to you know a three-hour beer geek on-site experience, um, we had you covered. You know our beer adventurers are experts in their field. Um, not only in craft brewing, but we expect them to be experts in sustainability initiatives, the craft beer industry, our history, the brewing process, ingredients, adjuncts, everything in between. And um, I think um, post COVID now we've tried to replicate that same high quality experience, um, probably more so from a virtual capacity though. Yeah, that sounds amazing. It sounds like some tours I'd love to do when <laughs> hopefully reopen sooner rather than later. Uh, can you also let the folks listening in, can you give them an idea of how you measure the success of these tours uh, on events before you started working with Any Road? Yeah, so the short story is we didn't. <laughs> um, we had an Excel spreadsheet where we would track um, tour numbers, um, attendance rates. Um, I think only recently prior to any road, we were starting to track cancellations or no shows. Um, so we were kind of measuring our success based on uh, program growth volume. So number of guest touches, all relative to that Excel spreadsheet. So it was subject to human error, um, opinion bias, um, but it did allow us to generically track trends in attendance. So we could see ebbs and flows with the season. Um, we could identify trends slightly, yeah. um, but certainly nowhere near where we're at with uh, our current data. Right, so you're re really just focusing on that kind of one metric before you started working with any road. And then can you give an idea of how you now know if your experience is successful? <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, the amount of data that we capture from our Any Road Insights is pretty significant, and that really does allow us to shape our experiences. Um, but just from a ground level, we're we're able to tell um, how much 
impact our experiences are having on our consumers once they leave, or our guests, once they leave our site and become consumers. Exactly. You can look at things like the qualitative data and understand things like the demographics so much better than before. Absolutely. Uh, I also understand that brand conversion was prioritized relatively recently for Sierra Nevada. What kind of triggered this shift in focus for you guys? You know, we, we always kind of identify our tour program as a very touchy-feely um, experience. We know we're impacting people that come to our site. We know we're having um, really high quality touches with our guests that we, we interact with, but we couldn't measure that. So taking these um, Any Road uh, insights and brand conversion specifically, we're able to tell, um, we're able to more measure the impact that we're having on the future intent to purchase or the actual intent to purchase. Did you purchase Sierra Nevada brands after you left um, from your experience? Yeah, I love it. And then how are you using this brand conversion kind of day to day? Is it to focus on things like purchase behavior, like you said, are you guys focusing on you know revenue in relation to brand conversion? How are you guys using that? Uh, that's a, that's a multifaceted question with a multifaceted answer. So brand conversion, again, kind of allows us to prove our program. We're not seen as a revenue generator on site. You know, guest experience isn't always something that's very tangible. So putting data behind it allows us to prove our concept a little bit more and really focuses on why, um, why our owners should trust us in our decision-making process. And something that I think is really important to establish is, yeah, we started measuring this in October, which felt probably a little bit late, um, but that, that data that we were able to capture established a trust that now that we're in times of virtual experiences and coronavirus and very un, I mean, we have no idea, uncharted territory. We have no idea where we're going. Um, it allows us to have that established trust a little bit more cohesively um, for our owners to trust us. So when I said, I, I want to take what we're doing and turn that into an online experience, since we're not able to welcome guests on site, you know, this was back in April and we had no idea how long this was going to last. I want to welcome guests on online as we would welcome them on site. And it took a little bit of time for them to warm up to that idea. But I think that trust that we established and proved ourselves with the brand conversion metrics um, really helped them kind of say, all right, let's see what you got. Um, and now it's, it's absolutely establishing a really cool program for us that we foresee going not only through the rest of the year, um, but also in tandem with on-site events when we do accept um, people back on site. Yeah, well, I'm so glad that, you know, Brian Conversion was able to give you that kind of proof of concept that you needed to, to really launch off the line and continue. So can you give an example of maybe how you created positive brand conversion at Terra Nevada? Were there certain tours where you had qualitative feedback that you used to maybe improve upon it and increase that brand conversion? Yeah, we definitely recognized a correlation after, um, you know, a couple of weeks, even a couple of months of analyzing our data. We recognized a, con a correlation between our highest revenue generating experiences and higher brand conversion. So our Beer Geek is a three hour, very intensive tour. Um, it's the highest paid experience that we have. So it's $50. The tour numbers are very small because we like to keep it a very intimate experience for those guests that come on site. Um, so we only take six or eight people on these experiences with a tour guide um, versus normally, you know, 20 to 25 people per tour. So they're getting a very intimate experience. What we were able to learn through our Any Road Insights is that this experience is booking out further in advance than any of our other experiences. So almost the day that we're publishing these experiences, those are the ones that are booking up first. So those are the highest demanded, but in analyzing that data, we also recognized that 
those are the ones that produce the highest brand conversion or the greatest percent of brand conversion. So you're taking someone who probably loves beer, loves craft beer, maybe they're home brewers, but don't know a lot about Sierra Nevada specifically. They just, you know, beer geek with Sierra Nevada look sounds great. After that three hour experience and that $50 investment from them, they're now our biggest brand loyalists and advocates. And that is absolutely priceless. When they go back out in the market, we're competing with shelf space. Craft beer, when we started brewing, there were 42 breweries across the in in entire country. Now there's over 8,500. So we have a big market of competition and we want to give them every emotional connection we can uh, to choose our product when they, when they see it on the shelf or to look for our product intently. And that's what brand conversion is helping us measure in relation to our experiences. Definitely. It reminds me of the main show and donuts. Great. the same. <laughs> They'll be looking for your beer now on the shelf, much like I am. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much. I've just got one last question for you here, which is what advice do you have for other brands who are trying to run successful experiences and create positive brand conversion? Um, a, get yourself a Liz. <laughs> she's my account manager with Any Road, and she's priceless. Um, uh, we've developed such a trust and rapport that um, she's just incredible. So uh, if you can find someone as good as her or get her specifically, you've done yourself a undue service. It's, it's amazing. Um, what advice? Um, I mean, Really, the rapport that we've developed with Any Road um, and the insights that we've been able to measure. And I mean, we're constantly looking to you guys for advice. Um, we know beer, we don't know insights and data and computers, um, but we trust that you guys do. And I think we've developed a, a great enough relationship with you to take that trust at face value. And when Liz makes recommendations, I truly know that she cares. Um, just as much about our experiences and making sure that we are delivering the the highest quality um, and most authentic experience that we can whether it's virtual or in person so she really does have our interests at, at best heart yeah i think like you say it's that partnership that's just so important you guys are the experts on the brewing and then we can obviously help out with recommendations based on the data on our end so i'm so happy that it's all working out and you love Liz so much we'll have to pass it on <laughs> it's absolutely a collaboration so um huge props to her she's been wonderful great well listen Amy thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me my pleasure in case people have specific questions at the end uh but for now I'm gonna hand over to the special guest for us thanks Amy thanks Tasha I am pleased to introduce Dan Calloway from Bardstown Bourbon. Dan, I'm going to unmute you here on my side and let's see if we can get the tech working. Dan, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear Wonderful. me all right? Wonderful. I can. Awesome. Thanks for joining today, Dan. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah. I hope the camera can see me. I can't see my uh, own face. I hope I'm in the, I switched over to my phone. So <laughs> hopefully you can see my head somehow. That's okay. We've got you. We've got you in this picture on the slide here. So we'll make sure uh, that people know who you are. And and I would love for for you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and about the experiences that you lead at at Bardstown Bourbon Company. Awesome. Well, um, so Dan Calloway, I head up all our front facing operations. So at Bardstown Bourbon Company, it's a it's a modern distillery. We're, we're brand new on the trail. We started distilling in 2016. Um, from there, we've quadrupled in size. We're right in the bourbon capital of the world, Bardstown, Kentucky. Um, we have a full service restaurant. We have uh, tours, cocktail classes, tastings, barrel thieving, and then top 10 size for volume in custom distilling. We make bourbon for ourselves as uh, well as some brands you've probably heard of, Jefferson's, High West, Kentucky Owl. So we're, we're positioning to be a hub on the bourbon trail. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I've I've seen some of the great feedback that you all have received, and I know it's a it's a bit of a destination spot out there in Bardstown. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I'm curious, you know, how you measured the success of all those experiences uh, before any road or before you brought them onto our platform. Yeah, I, um, it's interesting because each piece came one at a time, and we kind of measured them separately. Uh, we had our distillery, which would be our bourbon brands, which people talk about and review. 
Then came our restaurant two years ago, which you could look at Yelp or, or Facebook and kind of anecdotally gather from people coming in and out the door. And then tours are coming up on a year. And what any road enabled us to do is create experiences to, to have connectivity and kind of link everything together and get people's perception, like you said, qualitatively and quantitatively, uh, kind of joining each piece of that. What do they think about our bourbon compared to, you know, their comments on the restaurant and the tours and really gauge the complete experience, which has been great. Amazing, amazing. So now that you have all these different systems in place, uh, how do you know if your experiences are successful now? Like what are, what are you looking at in terms of your metrics? Yeah, well, everything, you know, you've been talking about on this call has, has just been so wonderful for us. Uh, being a new brand, everything we're about is that brand conver uh, version. It's so interesting to see people that haven't heard of us and wouldn't recommend us before they come into the door spend the time with them and, and see that positive change. Um, you know, our mantra is just building fans of the brand. So that's mm -hmm. what we're about, uh, return visits and then someone buying a bourbon on the shelf 10 years from now. Yeah, amazing. I'm, I'm sure that there are people out there who are asking, how do, you, how do you do it, Dan? Like what goes into making a successful brand conversion experience? Yeah, uh, we, we like to think of it as, as a personal connection, right? And um, uh, like, like was said before, you know, with COVID, limiting tours has helped us with that way and following that feedback and finding ways to, to have a little more personal attention with guests coming in. Uh, with some distilleries closed in the area, uh, we've actually seen our popularity go up a little bit because uh, there's less games in town. Um, and it's been kind of pumping the brakes, keeping the experiences a little smaller, not getting overwhelmed. So the people we do bring in uh, have a positive, uh, a positive time here. So really trying to create genuine connections between our guides and our guests. And, and that's obviously taking care of the guests, but then also taking care of the guides, keeping them excited pumped up, fired to come, fired up to come to work every day, keeping their education knowledge going, but all that goes into making connections. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm curious, Dan, I know we've, we've talked about this a little bit, and this has been a challenge for some of the brands we work with is how do you create that connection and that positive brand conversion with something like an online experience where they're not there seeing, yeah. seeing your smiling face, seeing your beautiful property, tasting your, your products, how do you create that online? Such a good question. Uh, it's something we've been battling with the last few months and feel like we've had some success with too. Um, it comes down to, we found the recurring online experiences to be successful. So it started as weekly and then as things progress, it's monthly, but it almost turned into a virtual cocktail club and people will tune in to, to almost see their friends on there, having it less like a lecture more where there's interaction both between guests and with the guide. Um, any personality we can put into an experience, uh, the, the more people are going to enjoy it and want to come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I know you've covered a lot of, I think, practical tips and things that people can, can walk away with if they're looking to, to do something similar, but what other advice um, might you have for brands who are trying to create that connection and trying to have a positive brand conversion? Yeah, I think, you know, it was interesting. I would say take the other tours in your area and the bourbon trail. That's very easy to do. Find out how you can improve on it. Right. And for us, mm -hmm. it was some very simple things, having more tactile experiences, more things you can touch. We pull bourbon right out of the barrel Every other bourbon trail, they taste bourbon at the end. You kind of sit through a lecture to get to bourbon at the end. So we start right out of the gate with t uh, tasting, then connect it with the tour. Um, you know, how can you differentiate yourself? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think we, we pay our guides better. We, we take that expense to, to get quality informed people. They're excited about the brand that have opportunities to, to rise up through there. So we, we have a quality experience from, from start to finish. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and we everyone reads a simple book, Setting the Table. If, if anyone on this call hasn't read that, just about customer service and connectivity. And, you know, I'd be remiss not to mention the advice that comes from Jared and Any Road. Uh, we just had our, our check-in a few weeks ago, and we 
immediately put about four different initiatives into place that came directly from him um, and are seeing the positive effects already from that. Wonderful. That's so, so great to hear. And, and we're so happy to see the success uh, of yourself and of Bardstown Bourbon. I know that you're, you know, very open to experimentation and taking these data and insights and turning them into action. Uh, and we, we're just so happy and, and proud of your success. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dan. And um, hopefully you can stick around and maybe get answer some questions from the audience as well. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dan. And I'm going to turn it over to Tasha to round it out. Great. Thanks, Lauren. So one final question for everybody today is, would you rely on a metric like brand conversion to measure the impact of your experiences? So now that you've heard a little bit more about brand conversion, maybe for those of you who hadn't, or for those of you that have, and now you've had some more insight, would you rely on a metric like this to measure the impact of your experiences? We need a little Jeopardy music here uh, while the polls are running, but we do have a lot of responses coming in. Give it a few minutes just so that we have time at the end to answer some questions. Perfect. Great. So these are the results from poll three. Amazing. I'm so happy to see that so many of you would, would rely on this metric now that we've taken you through it. And for those of you that aren't sure if you do have any questions or there's anything we can clarify for you at the end, please do ask a question in the chat box or you can always email us. And just before we get to those questions, we wanted to give some advice on how to get started with brand conversion for those of you who are interested. So the first step with this is collecting the pre and post MPS question. As we know now, this question is asked to measure how experiences impact, I guess, MPS by measuring the before and the after. So you need to start asking that question before the experience and after that. Secondly, we would recommend calibrating, which is collecting baseline data and then also calibrating with holistic KPIs and industry benchmarks where possible. Brand conversion on its own is, some, is sometimes not enough. You may need to also combine it with things like overall NPS, sales target, targets, marketing opt-in conversion, brand loyalty, um, all of which can also be measured by any road. Number three is start to experiment. Try new things during your experiences based on brand conversion trends that you're seeing with guests. And finally, stay guest focused. Don't focus solely on the numbers. Use the qualitative data as well as quantitative by talking to guests and staff and balancing brand conversion on your performance dashboard where possible. So that is everything we've put together for you all today. Thank you so much for joining. And we hope that you found this webinar interesting and insightful. We have time now for a few questions which you can submit in the chat box. Or if you'd like to speak with us further about anything that was presented today, please feel free to email us at experiences at and we would be happy to speak to you. So I can see here we have a few questions. So the first, first question we have here is generic products promoted by government associations. What would be our brand conversion? So I think for in order to, to measure your brand conversion, you would need to start asking those pre and post NPS questions. You could certainly look at the industry average and use this to measure against, but in order to actually know your specific brand conversion, you would need to be, to be asking those pre and post MPS questions and then doing that conversion that Lauren walked you through before. Another question we have here, Lauren, if you maybe want to take this one, is what is the average response rate for pre and post experience? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I think that it does somewhat depend on the industry and the brand that we're working with. Um, I think generally what we see is if the brand decides to make the pre experience question mandatory, we do get 100% response rate on that one. I think uh, consumers are, are pretty used to an answering some questions, filling in some information when they register for an experience. And then the post experience average, again, does vary somewhat depending on the brand and the industry, as well as sort of the 
the tone that the brand takes at the end of the experience. So we have some folks who are experts here like Sierra Nevada and Bardstown who are weaving in this element of connectivity and feedback as being critical to their brand growth. And for brands who do that, I mean, you can get anywhere from 30 to 50% response rate on that post experience question. I think for brands who struggle to make that connection or struggle to um, emphasize the, um, the importance of getting feedback from their guests or engaging with their guests' feedback, um, you may see a, a lower average, maybe closer to 10%. Um, and outside of any road, I think the average response rate to an NPS survey is, is about 15%, but it can go as low as 3%, again, depending on um, just the mechanisms that you use for, for surveying and your brand's emphasis on the importance of guest feedback. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. We have another question here from Joe, which is what is any roads experience in measuring trade show and festival experiences where you may not have pre-event registration data? So I think in this case, if you're wanting to measure brand conversion, as we mentioned, it's really important to get that pre-event registration data. But if you didn't have that, but you had enough information, potentially email addresses to ask the post MPS question, then you could still be measuring that NPS score. So that post experience NPS score can still be measured without the pre-event registration data, but brand conversion, you would need both pre-event and post event registration data to be measuring that. Lauren, I don't know if you have anything else to, to add on there, but I think. Yeah, I think for specific use cases that you're you're potentially grappling with, what could we do beforehand? Um, it's great to reach out to our team. Actually, we've come out with some really creative solutions for the different brands we've worked with across different industries uh, to see what the best metrics are for them and how they can be incorporating those into their guest experience without it feeling like a very awkward um, interaction to collect data. It, it becomes more of a seamless brand touch that gives you as a brand an opportunity to engage and to connect instead of it being a barrier for the guest. Um, so I would just say, reach out to us and we can explore some solutions together. Great. And one final question is, why would guests who don't have an opinion of a brand, so maybe somebody that haven't heard of a brand before or had a negative view of it, why would they be attending experiences? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think that this kind of goes to something that Dan said earlier is there's sometimes people, people book your, your tour experience and maybe they just don't know that much about you. Maybe their friend told, told you about them. Maybe they saw your, your sign on a billboard. Um, they have some sort of impression um, and maybe it's that they just want to try you out, but they've maybe never tasted your product before or never interacted with your, your store before if you're in retail. And so I think, um, some brands are surprised that they have quite a few people who maybe just don't have a lot of information about their brand coming to these experiences. Um, and as Dan mentioned, the experience gives you, you know, an hour or two or three in, in some of Amy's cases to really form that connection and, and educate people who just may not know that much about your brand. Definitely. Well, that is all the questions that we had today. If anybody can think of anything Later, please email us at experiences at anyroad.com. Oh, sorry, just to add on to that, this is interesting. John G has just written in that they get a lot of fives to start for people that have never been on a brewery tour or heard of founders. So kind of what to, to what Laura was saying, people that maybe haven't heard of the brand before or they've never been on that type of experience before, that may be the type of person who, who's giving a detractor score but still coming to the experience. But yes, that's, that's all we have time for today. Thank you everybody so much for joining. Do reach out to us if you have any more questions and we hope you have a great day. Thanks everyone.